Okay, I'm thrilled to welcome you to our event today entitled Life in the Time of COVID-19, The Poetics and Politics of Immobility in the Caribbean, from the perspectives of three scholars with years of experience in these contexts. I'm Lauren Derby, the Director of the Caribbean Program at UCLA. This is the second event of the Caribbean Program since our academic life has gone remote. And this event today could only be held virtually since the participants are currently in Brazil, the Dominican Republic, and California. This is part of a series of colloquia, which UCLA's International Institute has organized on coronavirus in different parts of the world. So do check their website for more events in this series. I want to thank Brian Pitts and Alex Zhu of the Latin American Institute and the International Institute at UCLA for their technical and logistical help without which this event would have been impossible. Our format for today will be three short presentations with a follow-up collective discussion and Q&A about COVID-19 and its impact in Cuba, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic. One note about format. Please post your questions on the Q&A page within the webinar, and the panelists will respond to them at the end of the formal papers. Um, last but not least, uh, we wish to acknowledge the Tongva peoples of the Los Angeles Basin. So I'm going to introduce each speaker one by one before e their presentations. Shall we, we'll, we'll, we'll start off with Nancy Burke. Nancy J. Burke is a professor of public health and anthropology at the University of California, Merced. She's the editor of Health Travels, Cuban Healthcare on and off the island, and has served as co-director of the UC Cuba Academic Initiative based at UC Irvine since 2015. She's been working with colleagues at the Universidad de Ciencias Facultad Giron in Havana, Cuba for over a decade, and her current research includes a study of syndemic care for high cost, high utilizing safety net patients in the United States, an ethnography of cancer patient navigation programs in US public hospitals, and an ethnography of aging in contemporary Cuba. So let's um, welcome Nancy Burke for her presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Robin, for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm very excited to be here and to learn from the other presenters and from the participants. I'm going to share my screen now and hopefully do that successfully. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to be presenting a, a, a short version of what is in the process of becoming a longer essay entitled Care in the Time of COVID-19, Surveillance, Creativity, and Socioismo in Cuba. And um, at first I wanna note that the pictures that I'm gonna be showing are from online journalistic sources. And I've noted the source at the bottom of each slide to give credit. I haven't been on the island since lockdown, um, but I was there in January to conduct some research um, and have been going on and off since 1994. So on April 19th, the University of Information Sciences, in collaboration with the Ministry of Health, announced the launch of Virtual Screen, an app design, designed to provide real-time identification of those with COVID-19 symptoms. Users were told it's simple and instructed to download the app, input their personal information, and if they display symptoms, to record their location, their interactions over the previous week, and any contact with COVID-19 patients. Along with brigades of physicians and medical students going door to door to actively screen residents, provision of treatment and tests for anyone needing them, and police handing out fines for those not wearing masks, the app serves as a tool in Cuba's arsenal for controlling the spread of the virus that's been adapted from decades of effective infectious disease control. At the same time, new services are promoted on WhatsApp groups to deliver fresh vegetables to homes for those unwilling or unable to wait in long lines for daily provisions. Um, and some of those are, are for a charge. And then Paladara is the small um, uh, entre you know, individually owned restaurants have adapted delivery services to bring food to elderly residents for free. Mm -hmm. Daily communications on state TV from the president and the minister of public health while reiterating the importance of social distancing as a primary tool against contagion, acknowledge how hard it is not to kiss people hello and to maintain six feet between each other, especially for Cubans. 
So I'm interested in the productive tensions that are inherent in the expansive forms of surveillance and governance the Cuban state has enacted under the guise of caring for the population, official recognitions of conflict between public health um, measures and cultural values and practices such as those um, acknowledged by the president and minister of public health in their um, nightly discussions, and creative moves among individuals and groups to support each other while earning hard currency as forms of care. And I posit that the coexistence and intersection of these practices are made possible by Cuba's particular form of post-Soviet socialism and are productive for understanding how care is enacted and experienced in a time of crisis and geopolitical isolation. So while Arundhati Roy has posited that the pandemic is a portal through which we can imagine new futures, others have argued that pandemic response reveals what's already there. In the US, this has taken the form of revealing the gross generational inequities that have led to disproportionate burden of chronic illness and persistent poverty in black and brown populations, and the subsequent disproportionate burden of death from complications linked to COVID-19. In Cuba, it's revealed that the reforms and slight changes over the last 20 years or so have been just that, slight. The pandemic response has reinstantiated the value of what had been lauded as the key triumphs of the revolution, universal primary health care, investment in education, and commitment to addressing inequality and injustice throughout the world as operationalized in, um, in international medical missions. This has resulted in swift and effective containment of the virus made possible by um, the mobilization of over 28,000 medical students conducting active screening door to door across the island. And these are um, Cuban medical students as well as international students like the one pictured who's from the US. Also the imposition of forced quarantine at both the individual and community levels and um, access to testing as needed. Today, Cuba has just over 1,900 cases of the virus, 1908, and 80 deaths. This works out to seven deaths per million. Just to put that in context, if you compare it with Portugal, there's 125 per million. Germany has 99 per million. Sweden, 384. The United States, 289. And Spain, 596 per million deaths. It's clear that Cuba's pandemic response is effective. And um, just again, the world median is 42.6 deaths per, um, one, per million and Cuba's rate is seven. At the same time, the strong arm of the state and the consequences of non-compliance are in full force. In April, six people confined to, confined to an isolation center, which the isolation centers are adapted hotels or schools, um, in Santo Espiritus escaped. And um, upon their arrest, they were found at home, at their homes within um, 24 hours. Um, they were uh, subjected to a, between three months and a year in, um, in prison. Um, police also started imposing fines um, of 300 pesos, the equivalent of some Cubans, um, basically a month's salary in April, under the supposition of Article 87 of the Penal Code, which um, it discusses crimes, crimes against health. But the specific degree, uh, decree was not published until May 12th, which has caused some discussion among legal scholars. Alcohol sales were limited in April and drinking was prohibited in public. And those criticizing the state's approach or deemed to spread false information on social media um, have also been subjected to fines up to 3,000 pesos in arrest. As noted by Amalia Perez, who is a, a Cuban um, lawyer as well as a graduate student at UC Merced, and I quote, along with the amplifying effects of inequality and precarity associated with this crisis, the expansion of authoritarianism hidden in the justification of health management and prevention is also a risk. So pandemic response um, has also revealed what was already there in sense of the creativity and care Cubans have for each other. While over a thousand Cuban medical professionals work in 18 countries as part of the Henry Reeves Brigade, Cubans wait in long lines for groceries, 
um, have it challenges with social distancing in these long lines be, um, due to trying to get into the shade and other things, um, and fumble with wearing masks as the temperature continues to rise. Crowded streets in, um, in central Havana, which became one of the hotspots for the virus spread, weren't really sur surprising considering the state of the buildings, rising temperatures, and the need to resolve in a time of uncertainty. So people needed to get out and do what they needed to do to make sure that their families had um, what they needed for, to, to eat. Um, in January, while I was conducting research on, on aging on the island, I was told over and over about how President Trump's crackdown on trade was impacting the availability of prescription drugs, particularly hypertension medicines, which many people take daily, and food availability. At that time, which seems like a world ago, just, just January, um, people were traveling across the city at the drop of a hat when there was a rumor that one store might have something like canned tomatoes in order to get them before they disappeared because things were appearing and disappearing really episodically. These sanctions have also, since the um, initiation of the pandemic, impacted the available personal protective equipment and um, real-time PCR tests on the island, which are used to, um, to, to get a sense of the spread, um, both of which have been acquired through donations from the Pan American Health Organization and trade with China and through domestic pr uh, production in terms of PPE. The long lines in central Havana, that particular form of waiting that um, Catherine Verdery uh, re referred to as socialist time, also include neighbors buying food for the elderly. And these are the Cubans that are most at risk. As we know, the, one of the, the greatest risk factors for um, having adverse reactions to COVID-19 is not only age, but also uh, being over 60, but also the existence of comorbidities. So 20% of Cubans are over the age of 60. And uh, a, a high majority suffer from hypertension, diabetes, um, and other cardiovascular illnesses. If current trends continue, almost three and a half million uh, Cubans will be in this age group by 2030 which would be 30% of the population and would make Cuba the oldest um, nation in Latin America and the Caribbean. So clearly the control of the pandemic is especially important with such a large part of the population falling in this risk group. Um, these elders live, those who live in, for example, Havana, um, live in a city that one of the island's leading architects described as not for old people. Nearly 80% of the buildings in Havana were built between 1902 and 1958, and there hasn't been much re replacement of existing structures. In central Havana, where, which was this um, hotspot for the epidemic, 85% of the housing stock is over 80 years old, and the remainder um, is between 40 and 80 years old. And much of it is crumbling and in dire need of repair. So this is not, you know, the parts of the city right along the, the Malecon, this is sort of the inner part of the city where the airflow is quite different. And, um, and it becomes um, a sort of an example of what Io Wahlberg has referred to as one of the challenges facing efforts to flatten the curve around the world, um, which is a disregard for the life and living conditions of the majority of the people. In other words, sheltering in place in a a uh, crumbling building with not great air circulation is, um, is not the same as, uh, as doing it in a, in a more comfortable, um, safer place. So in addition to waiting in lines and shopping for each other, thanks to the cellular access that was granted in 2018, Cubans established, uh, have established WhatsApp groups to facilitate grocery delivery to the elderly. And, um, uh, restaurants such as um, Cafeteria Yankee's Pan um, repurpose their delivery service to ensure that elderly Cubans receive groceries at home. And so this image is of uh, the cadre of electric motorcycles that they have delivering prepared foods for free to, a Cuban, to Cubans who are over 60 who shouldn't be leaving their homes. They, they, also have their you know, business on the side, but this is a, a free service that they've developed. <laughs> and it, 
I, I, I'm thinking of things like this as sort of quick adaptations of the long Cuban tradition of socioismo, um, which is the use of social networks and friendships to meet daily needs. And it's been described in depth by other anthropologists, Sean Brotherton and Hannah Garth, um, among others. Um, and so using this technology, people are in this context of this unprecedented context of a pandemic. People are able to use um, this platform to create new forms of connection and support. WhatsApp has also facilitated entrepreneurial opportunities such as gyms offering free classes and renting out bicycles um, and restaurants and cafeterias being able to deliver pizzas, fresh juice, dinners, and other things. And even Cuber, Cuba's version of Uber, um, has taken advantage of the platform to expand from providing rides, which no, people are not really using it for right now, to delivery of groceries and other products. So in short, the pandemic response does reveal what was already there. And in Lisa Stevenson's terms, um, it reveals a bureaucratic approach to population health, which is in and of itself a form of anonymous care that uses punitive means of enforcement, but provides care for our population and ensures its well being, while also affording the creation of new forms of relational care and entrepreneurism, utilizing online platforms and cellular data. Both are made possible by Cuba's socialist and social infrastructure, including training of a deep and expansive public health workforce and the changes, albeit complicated, that have occurred with the opening of the economy since the 1990s. These forms of connectedness inherent in, social, in socialist and social infrastructures enable creative approaches to resolver in a context where the combination of US sanctions, loss of tourist revenue, and the pandemic make it more and more difficult to do so. So thank you, and I'm happy to take questions either now or later. I'm not sure how we want to do that. Well, what I would suggest is that we hold, we hold on to the questions and we'll do a kind of collective Q&A at the end. So let me introduce our next speaker. Dr. Cesar Herrera is a, is a, um, a most interesting and unusual combination of cardiologist and creative writer. As someone who considers affairs of the heart from the full range of possible angles. This is actually a very Caribbean profile, and I can think of other Dominican doctors who've written essays, books, and memoirs, but I would say it's a lot less common, unfortunately, in the United States. He's currently director of CEDIMAT, Centro Cardi Cardiovascular, Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic, and he's also one of the founding co-editors of Plenamar, a journal of literature, arts, and commentary based in Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic, a very interesting new online journal, which I urge you to check out. He's the author of many articles in the field of cardiology, as well as Extrasistoles y Otros Accidentes, Seducir los Sentidos, Cuerpo Accidente y Geografía, y La Flama Magna. So thank you, um, Hochi. Thank you, Robin. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Um, I think you are trying to brag about your Spanish pronunciation by mentioning those books. It wasn't necessary, but thank you. <laughs> I want to thank you for, for inviting me. Um, I'm a social observer. I'm not a social scientist. So I hope the students uh, take something home from these observations in the Dominican Republic, what I've been living now for five years. Um, Brian is gonna help me with the slides because for some reason I can't put them up. So if I can have the first one, please. Um, the first 20th century pandemic to affect the Dominican Republic was the influenza, so-called Spanish fever of 1918. Um, Frank Moya Pons, a renowned uh, Dominican historian in his book, The Other Dominican History, puts the numbers of deaths uh, close to 2000 people and another 100,000 infected. Uh, that leads to a case, a case fatality rate of 2%. That's understanding that the Dominican Republic had about 800 uh, to 150,000 inhabitants at the time. Let us not forget either that during, the, during that time, the uh, Dominican Republic was still under the control of the US occupying forces. 
uh, during our first invasion between 1916 and 1924. Next slide, please. Uh, throughout history, disease and epidemics have seemed simultaneously induced and become subjects of analysis at the larger intercontinental scale. In younger and smaller nations, however, like the Dominican Republic, where complex and rapidly evolving geographical, political, and cultural factors may influence the biology of causative microorganisms, people's attitudes and behaviors, as well as governmental responses and their impact, that has been less studied. The Dominican Republic, as the image shows, shares several unique factors relevant to COVID-19, including a permanently warm and humid climate, proximity to other densely populated islands, a highly valued tourist industry with nearly 7 million visitors per year, significant financial support from expats residing overseas, a younger population compared to South America, the US and Western Europe, and strong social networks where physical contact and affection are paramount as we will see later. But perhaps more importantly, the DR has a suboptimal healthcare system where large segments of the population have limited access to medical evaluation on top of their already strained financial status. These are realities that will likely become key determinants of the success of isolation in this pandemic in the near future. It is in this context that during the early weeks of 2020, and not too differently from what occurred in the United States, citizens and governmental officials in DDR awakened to the threat of COVID-19, initially confronting it with a casual and relaxed approach, quote unquote. By late February, early March, this quickly changed to a more structured governmental response catapulted by public pressure to close airports and ports and the implementation of social isolation and curfew measures as national priorities. Next slide. Interestingly, the suspected sources of the initial wave of infections, and this is public knowledge all over the media, the initial um, wave of infections and perhaps even some deaths of prominent public figures were affluent Dominicans returning from Europe, many of whom participated in elite social gatherings. It is widely believed that transmission began in this context. Whether that is true or not, that pattern expanded to middle class and low income segments of the population, particularly to towns and provinces of Santiago and San Francisco de Macris, both of which have nearby international airports and high frequency of travel to the island from Dominican Americans. That image shows to your left and your right what has now become an infamous wedding in uh, Punta Cana, actually Cap Cana, next to Punta Cana, where the wedding motif and the allegory was the COVID pandemic and people were encouraged to line up behind the bar pharmacy to get vaccinated and immunize against coronavirus with uh, drinking alcohol. Next, <laughs> furthermore, unique popular and religious beliefs towards the pandemic have surfaced prominently during the last several weeks of confinement, at times reaching what I call surreal Macondo-like realities with potentially dying public health implications, such as the self-proclaimed pilgrim, as shown in the image, who carrying a wooden cross on his shoulder, followed God's call, quote unquote, to crisscross half of the island by foot while being joined by large crowds and escorted by public ambulances and police cars on his way to the northern shore of Puerto Plata, where he would deposit the cross as a sign that the following day, the Dominican Republic would become COVID free. Also, the dosing of citizens who passed away as the result of clereng intoxication. Mm. Clereng is an alcoholic drink similar to moonshine that is believed to possess curative powers. Next slide. And last but not least, the Catholic Church's aerial blessing, what I call a celestial blessing, which was delivered to the nation via a helicopter flown for that specific purpose, as the video shows. We know that most religious denomination groups worship as groups, 
that is the predominant pattern indeed. However, this has been changing for the past several years, particularly in the United States, where technology, TV, mass media, radio, and internet have taken over. Some have argued that these changes are the result of reduction in activities, and excuse me, in active religious practices. Others call it disappointment, and others find this dissolution, especially among Catholics. What is new, certainly, is the sudden disruption in religious observance with the COVID-19 pandemic, a fact that has prompted the improvisation of new ways of delivering God's message. Next slide. Time Magazine, for example, reported that some churches are meeting in drive-in theaters while maintaining social distancing. The image to the left represents a drive-through confession in a parking lot near a church. And to the right is the image of a Detroit priest that sur surprises worshipers on Easter Sunday when he blessed children and their toys using a water pistol. And then there is already the already mentioned helicopter blessing in the Dominican Republic. In, in the sociological reconstruction and analysis of these unusual actions, it must be kept in mind that scholars have agreed for some time that religion represents a major social institution and that it serves as a significant integrative entity providing individuals and society at large with stabilizing forces that would presumably help and confront crises like COVID-19. Next slide. Poetry indeed has resurfaced in these difficult times in the Dominican Republic within certain intellectual circles. Social media has facilitated numerous initiatives where poets, writers, artists, etc., and in fact, anyone can post their own pieces as means of a spiritual healing, all from the, comfort, from the comfort of home. Other forms of poetry are also easily found in the many survival skills that Dominicans have embraced during these times. Affordable homemade masks and gloves, like the handsome boy to your right is wearing. They're sold in neighborhood colmados. The thousands of creative cartoons and videos posted on YouTube and WhatsApp ridiculing the language of brand new philosophers and scientists alike, notably divorced from their realities. Or, next slide, a, a small town in the south of the island curfew violator who is rushing to his house on a horse while being chased by motorcycles riding cops, as the image shows. I took this picture next from my car a couple of days ago showing a gentleman that looks fairly nicely dressed. He's a street beggar and he has a broomstick that has a plastic at the end and he kicks the window of the uh, cars passing by and is stopping at the light asking for money. Next. Meanwhile, the fate of the epidemic as of yesterday, May 20th in the Dominican Republic, although it does not seem to be out of control, remains elusive to say the least. That is given the limited testing available, which by the way was only obtained at private labs for the equivalent of $100 per test, and also the lack of compliance with social isolation and curfews from a population already living under precarious conditions and whose only source of income often is self-employment in informal economies mostly carried on the streets has complicated the matters. The video shows a clip that became viral yesterday representing the uh, metro, the subway, the first day that it was open uh, after two months of being uh, out of service. Next, of course, is the economy in the next. Um, Fitch Ratings is a think tank that, uh, among other things, predicts the economic behavior of uh, countries outside the US. And on May, May 8th, they put out their report in the Dominican Republic. Um, Bernardo Vega, another um, respected historian here, commented on it. Basically, the report uh, states what we know, which is that there would be a sharp fall in the economy in the country, that the already um, affected uh, governmental balance sheet would get worse, and that the uncertainty driven by the July 5th presidential elections would make things even worse. The report seems to be optimistic by some uh, interpretation, uh, stating that things will get better, quote unquote, by 2021. Look at the numbers there. 
the prediction is that the deficit will increase to $3.7 billion, uh, that the gross domestic product will fall to 3.5% from the current 6%, and that the two main sources of income of the country, tourism uh, will drop by 50%, and remittances will drop by at least 20%. That's the economic outlook that we have ahead. Next, stay home, Duquesa speaks. For those of you who don't know it, Duquesa is the name of the largest uh, garbage and uh, non-organic disposal uh, plant in Santo Domingo that decided to catch, catch in fire about five weeks ago, six weeks ago. So, well, if, if staying inside has not been enough of a challenge for Dominicans who live in Santo Domingo, this city's uh, uh, burning uh, garbage disposal crisis has made things worse to the point that it has become a highly politicized um, issue in, in the presidential election that we're having right now. Next, last but not least to finish, I wanna say that uh, those signs of ever-present suspected governmental corruption have also surfaced, such as the distribution of goods for political purposes, or the widely publicized case of overpriced bids by some national hospital service officials, coupled with the recent cancellation of municipal elections resulting from ballot failures. All of those have painted quite a complex picture in anticipation of July's election. Poetry and politics, symbolism and representation, hope and reality are thought-provoking, rarely seen pairs in this half island nation that for quite some time has not looked inwards during a crisis, especially a crisis like this one. Is there time for Dominicans to face the reality of isolation, the ever missed opportunity of addressing common concerns and dangers with their neighbors, meaning their immediate neighbors? Only time will tell. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Okay, so our next speaker, I, I, there are some questions which are popping up, but we're going to do um, the Q&A at the end uh, after our, our next speaker, who is Rodrigo Bulama, who is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Graduate Program of Social Sciences at the Federal um, University of Sao Paulo. He's been working in Northern Haiti since 2012, combining ethnographic fieldwork with historical analysis, focusing on themes such as mobility, kinship, historicity, and ecology. His actual research draws on ecologies of practice, environment, and energy in Haiti through analyzing the social life of wood charcoal and its representations and engagements in multiple scales. Thank you. Thank you, Robin, uh, for the invitation, first of all. And thank you also, Brian Pitts, for taking care of all the practical issues and organizing this webinar. So I'm really glad uh, to meet Cesar and Nancy, uh, as, well, as well as to engage in a conversation with all the, the participants afterwards. So my presentation will focus on Haiti, and it's quite uh, uh, preliminary, right? I'm also trying to kind of grasp some ideas and put them together through uh, dialogues with, with some of my interlocutors and friends from Haiti. So my intention here is to talk about how the pandemics is evolving in the country, trying to grasp some ethnographic aspects of how people from North and Haiti are dealing with COVID-19. So just to give you a wider uh, picture before going, before going into details, according to Johns Hopkins Observatory, the figures in Haiti are around almost 600 confirmed cases and uh, 22 deaths in a country that has only four medical centers with a total of 200 beds. And models are predicting that they will need up to 9,000 beds as cases can reach uh, uh, up to around 300,000. And uh, as Nancy mentioned, tests uh, in, in, in Haiti are around 200 per million. And if we, we, if we compare to, to the Dominican Republic, it's very, very, very low because in the, in the, in the DR, it's around 5,600. So it's very, very low. Of course, as we, we've been following around the globe, there is a huge under notification a bit everywhere due to lack of access to testing, to prices, or explicit political intention, as is the case of Brazil specifically. 
so a few weeks a few weeks ago i was home in brazil trying to reach uh, out to george a friend of mine from northern haiti to know how he and his family were dealing with the pandemic there and he told me you know rodrigo we can't help live in our houses he was describing the current situation of residents of milo a historic village in the north of the country as he continued, we hear that around the world, at least they're offering something for people to eat and have some money. But, but there's no such thing here, he concluded. Rumors of a respiratory disease began to reach the country to reports from relatives from the diaspora, a subject that soon reached radio stations, virtual communication apps, and everyday conversations in neighborhoods and popular markets. The need for social distancing, however, was met with skepticism, not only not out of disbelief in its effectiveness, but out of resignation to a situation that does not seem new. Working in Northern Haiti since 2012, the fear of not being able to move around was something, something that always caught my attention. Facing radical uncertainties, uh, uncertainties similar to those in, we find in other post-plantation contexts, People constantly de describe themselves as, and I quote, looking for life in Haiti as well as abroad. So if in 2012, many defined the country as blocked or blockies, as they used to say, and we could hear that, that phrasing in popular songs and, and many local narratives, somewhere in, in 2019, somewhere around July and August, New, a new political and, and, and economic, new political and economic impasses led to the creation of a new metaphor. Around this time in 2019, fossil fuel prices went high and demonstrations against the, against the recent elected president, Jovenel Moise, became more and more common. People were not able to move around as gas prices made it hard for them to fill their motorcycles tanks or pay for collective transportation. This happened in a country that depends mainly on the circulation of agricultural products and imported goods that people buy and sell in popular markets. So the word locked or lock, an English neologism that quickly, was quickly incorporated into Haitian Creole took over the street as the metaphor used to describe both the country and the bodies of people in general. Trapped socially Trapped socially and physically, as people used to say, and I quote, whoever is below cannot go up and whoever is above cannot go down. Interesting enough, it was due to the fact that the country was locked that tourists stopped arriving. And this helped delay the spread of the virus. But the threat of a new epidemic has intensified this, this general sense of immobility. Indeed, rumors of the disease also gave rise to historical metaphors about pathogens that affected the country before, such as African swine fever, AIDS, and cholera. All of them referred to as maladie blanc or uh, foreigners <laughs> disease. Uh, so when I quote my friend George again, they say that, in, that the United States are dropping a powder from planes that press, pass through here. Indeed, George was echoing a common reasoning about why Haitian Creole pigs were killed back in the early 80s. In fact, in Haiti, harmful powdered substances are one of the main ways to send sickness to someone else in order to gain access to wealth. We can describe it as a form of assault sorcery to use a concept that anthropologist Nay Whitehead has coined and that Robin Derby has prolifically connected to action of magic in Haiti and the DR. Resulting from a combination of techniques and magical materials, these artifacts can affect a person's garden and livestock, as well as her luck in daily trades, and in, in extreme cases, even her vital flow. Holding, holding tying or restraining, or in Haitian Creole, barre, kembe, campe, are, expression that speak, are expressions that speak of bodily and mental, mental and social states. This makes sense when we take into account that movement is the central element in the constitution of social relations, both in daily exchanges between neighborhoods and relatives through uh, nurturing people and nurturing at the same time social bounds, and also in the constitution of regional 
popular markets, right? Uh, if, you, if you take a look, if, you, if you've ever been to Haiti, uh, uh, if you look at the popular market, there's movement everywhere in a way of things, people, uh, news, rumors, etc. So unlike African swine fever, COVID-19 crossed the border between animal and human, animals and humans, finding a pathway via zoonotic spillover. With the progress of the disease that enters the country as a poisonous powder and the need for seclusion and social isolation, the feeling of stagnation and danger becomes even more intense. More than any other metaphor, being locked represents both a temporal and existential state, not only the total loss of the ability to predict the course of days, but also the end of the autonomy to move and get things going. For George, as, our, as well as for other friends, this existential immobility bears close resemblances to what is conceived of, of as the colonial times or tan colonie, revealing how historical metaphors are lived by. So uh, it is clear that each society has its own ways uh, of dealing with catastrophe, anticipating events by mobilize, mobilizing previous experiences, as we've been hearing from, the, from Nancy and Cesar. Earthquakes, wars, and even soccer championships, as we saw in the case of Argentina, are historical events that help us understand the current crisis while, while, while also opening paths for dealing with it. Far from distancing people from their past, this new pandemic seems to transform the old fears into new anxieties, revealing a wide variety of historical experiences. At the same time, this crisis seems to anticipate a global future that was already in the horizon, in an accelerated, accelerated version of the disaster scenario of climate crisis. Indeed, for many people, the expansion of COVID-19 can mean an acceleration of times, while for others, it can be a dive into stagnation. So to conclude, I think if, you, if we want to take into account here, oh, uh, sorry. So to conclude, I think we have to take into account here that this situation might not seem new to many societies in the world. It can be new for some of us, but we need to look at how human and more than human collectivist, collectivities have been facing extreme, extreme situations much, much before this pandemic. So instead of rushing ourselves to talk about trauma or any sort of exceptionality, we might want to carefully look at how people have their own ways of dealing with epidemics, crises, and extreme events. What we can say for now is that this global situation expanded uncertainties way beyond the usual social landscape. It's intensifying what we can call a shared sense of communality. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. All right. Um, so, so one, one thing I do want to make sure that all of our viewers are aware of is that um, you can submit questions using the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, I think we only have one question there right now. So those of you who have questions, please get, get to work submitting them. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. So uh, we have one question here, and I hope others will submit questions. Uh, from Matthew, the, the internet seems invaluable right now with the pandemic. Was the internet connectivity consistent for those in need of services? Maybe you can take turns answering. Sure, um, I can start. Um, so I have not heard of uh, problems with connectivity on the island. Um, there are about 7.1 million Cubans or 63% that have internet access um, and about 55% or over 6 million are active on social media according to the latest data. Um, and and the, the government as well as individual Cubans have been utilizing these um, access to data for uh, to re to have uh, as transparent communication as possible, and so one of the things that I want to mention related to that was that um, one of the reasons why I think Cuba has been so successful in their uh, response to the pandemic is that they started way early. Um, when I was on the island in January, people were already my colleagues who are um, involved in healthcare were already talking about concerns about the the coronavirus 
when it was still limited to China. Um, and they and the government had in starting in January started to have national meetings and start planning um, and even you know started identifying beds and ICU beds throughout the island identified um, uh, testing facilities um, so everything was starting to be put into place very early on. Um, but in terms of the use of the internet and the ways in which people have been using it, the state has used it in addition to uh, state TV to keep people informed about both what's happening on around the world as well as what's happening on the island um, in terms of case identification and um, when where there are hot spots, et cetera, as well as the challenges that they're experiencing with people hiding symptoms and other things. Um, they've also developed a um, a WhatsApp consultation service uh, called Psico Grupos, which is um, has different groups for um, older adults, families with children, essential workers, and families with family members abroad. And this is started by the um, Cuban Society of Psychology. So, um, and and they're also doing online grocery sales. So it, it, apparently people are very frustrated with the online grocery sales though, because it takes a long time. Um, but that's, yeah, so those are some things that are happening. Great. I haven't heard of any app uh, in, at least in Haiti, uh, at least for now that, that, that has the same function, function as Nancy described. But but that's an interesting point actually, like how how we, how people communicate communicate right. Uh, when we write about our ethnographic connections and dialogues with people, we tend to kind of uh, erase the difficulties of people uh, of people trying to get connected to talk to to people abroad, right? I have I have a friend that is writing something about that, uh, Nadege Mezier, and, and she 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 describes how. How hard it is to actually reach people and to have news from the, from them, right? How how much time it takes, and and but it's interesting to 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 learn uh, that one of the factors that helped Cuba a lot is that they 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 moved really fast because I think in general people were not believing that this would reach the Western Hemisphere, right? It was kind of like Chinese disease for a long time, right? Yeah. Well, in 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 the Dominican Republic, um, I think. The opposite may be happening. I, I've always thought of, that people are too connected here. Um, everyone has one or two cell phones. Um, social media has not, in my opinion, been utilized uh, for the better down here. There hasn't been a problem with the internet. In fact, it might, if I may say a few positive things, um, the private sector has come forward with a number of initiatives, including giving X number of hundreds of minutes free uh, internet free for people, uh, phone use for a month and things like that, knowing that the crisis obviously has affected people's pockets. The government though came up with something interesting, uh, which is a social media and also a telephone uh, site for questions about what to do, where to go, when to be worried about symptoms. Uh, they say they've received close to a half a million contacts for the last six to seven weeks so far. So I think for, for those who have, you know, who are savvy, technology savvy, and certainly for people who don't have, don't have uh, the proximity to hospitals or physicians care, that has been useful. Great, all right, so we have some more questions now. Um, we have for the three panelists, but especially for Nancy and Cesar, how do you think religion in each of the con these contexts is impacting the spread or containment of the virus? Are there any coordinations between government and organized religion? Nancy, you want to start? Um, sure, but I feel like you're probably going to have more to say about this than me. Um, so I, I, I'm not really... Um, Aware. Don't forget, forget Santeria. Yeah, well, exactly. That's where I'm thinking um, is the big issue. And, and I, I don't know, really, I can't speak to what's happening on the island right now, but I think that is a real consideration um, because just thinking about, I, I conducted uh, research on um, 
women's involvement in Santeria in the 1990s on the island. And a lot of the consultations that were happening at the time had to do with concerns about HIV AIDS exposure. Mm -hmm. And so I imagine that there might be some, um, some activity happening, but again, I'm, I, I haven't been on the island since, um, since the lockdown, so I'm, I'm not aware of that. For, for some of the more organized religions like churches and synagogues, they were asked by the state to, um, to start avoid large gatherings in, uh, in late March, around March 24th. And then of course, everything um, you know, was put into lockdown as it were with other, um, in general society. But I think that's an excellent question and um, perhaps one of our participants has more insight. Well, I, I think I showed some examples of the popular responses, uh, faith-based. Um, uh, the well, Dominicans are supposed to be believers and very religious people, etc. Um, there is no organized um, approach, if you will, uh, to social issues uh, by churches in general. There are areas in the country, smaller, where church and priests become important figures, but there isn't a structure as such that organizes responses to social uh, issues. Uh, and certainly there isn't anything between the government and the uh, Catholic Church, at least. Uh, but there has been, though, I must say, uh, interestingly, some complaints by, in Santiago specifically, by some uh, neighborhoods that apparently there are services being conducted uh, in person uh, by people sort of sneaking behind the doors and having uh, service with uh, people locked inside. But no, contrary to the African-American community, for example, in the U.S., where churches play a huge social and supportive role, uh, at least in, in the major cities in the DR, that's not the case. Rodrigo? Well, well for Haiti, I, I don't have much information about uh, like institutionalized uh, religious congregations, uh, but I think if you think about voodoo and, 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 and traditional uh, practices, I think it, it, it's more or less the same. Uh, uh, it has some, some connections with, I, with what I was, I was trying to say in, in my presentation, that uh, it, it generates anxiety, like you're not being able to, to do your rituals and, and, and offerings and stuff like that. It, it, I think it generates a bit uh, of, of some sort of sense of immobility, of not being able to to make these offerings offerings pass through, right? So I'll go on that, but I haven't I haven't like exp exp uh, went in details in, in that. So uh, Rodrigo, I do know though that in, in and let me let me go back a little bit. I'm not trying to suggest that the church does not get involved with you know, supporting the community. So mm -hmm. there are uh, things like that that happen here, and I know that there is a lot of exchange with the Haitian Catholic Church. Right, right. No, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm... but not as a culture of the church. Right. Right, right, right. Yeah, that would be interesting to 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 know, or at least how 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 Pope uh, Francis is actually being read, how, how his action actions are being read in this context. Mm -hmm. Right, he's been really engaging and and doing some like public uh, ritualized, uh, very intense uh, actions. Right, related to COVID. So it would be interesting to 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 learn how this has been read in this different contexts also. Well, I just want to make a brief comment in, uh, regarding the, the Dominican Republic because I studied the hurricane of San Zenon and I remember, you know, pilgrimages across the city. I mean, it was just pilgrim, pilgrims were everywhere. And I remember um, that they were collecting rocks and then laying down these stones as a kind of form of limpieza or something. So, um, you know, I think, you know, the, in, in the DR, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of popular activity you know, in a way that the folk church is, is, is you know, plays a really central role in, in the countryside. And I wonder what Cofradias and, um, are doing. But um, anyway, so we have another question from Nada, Nadej Messier. Rodrigo, Cesar, could you please tell us a bit about Haitians in the DR in this, in this moment? Are they eventually considered, are they being considered as a scapegoat? Are they being invited to leave the country? I am sure that some sectors of the establishment would have loved to use against escape quotes 
once again. But no, it hasn't happened because as I suggested earlier, and by no means this is an accusation of any sort, but it's an epidemiologic data, a fact, um, the origins of the transmission actually came from, from affluent Dominicans returning from uh, some tourists, a few, and then things spread. So no, in this particular case, uh, they have now been used as scapegoats. There was a little, I would say, exchange uh, between the politicians when three weeks ago, or so the chancellor made a comment about the urgent need of the Haitian government to embrace uh, steps to prevent the, the, the dissemination of the pandemia, because then it would come to the Dominican side and create more trouble. That was not well received by the Haitian government, and that was quickly silenced. Um, Sunday or Monday this week, our president gave his uh, bi-weekly, bi-monthly uh, speech, and he mentioned just superficially that he had talked to the Haitian president about the pandemic, but nothing else was, was said. So no, that, that has been very silent in that regard. Uh, so I'm not, I heard that Rafael Sanchez Herrera, uh, you, you can co correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Cesar, that he, he actually said he's the responsible of health, Minister of Health in the country, right? He actually said, and I quote, that Haiti became a ma major threat to the Dominican Republic from a health point of view, right? It wasn't but, the chancellor, it was the Minister of Health who said that. Okay. okay you were okay, right. Okay. So, okay. So, but, but okay. So that obviously did not turn out to be the truth. And in fact, the common word uh, in the public is, my God, what did Haiti do? They're not doing that bad, quote. Right. right. So mm -hmm. you're right, it was the Minister of Health. That was about two weeks ago. No, no, interesting. It's interesting because I think, like, I love to hear like uh, people talking about Dominican Republic. I love going there, right? Because I, found, I find many resemblances to, to, to lots of historical and social processes in Brazil. Uh, so when, when I heard you, your, your talk, Cesar, it, it called my attention the fact that it, 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 as in Brazil, it started uh, between the affluent, class, affluent classes, right? And then suddenly it, 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 it spread everywhere. And, and now it's affecting more uh, poor people. And, and, and symbolically, symbolically, the first death in Brazil was from a maid, uh, a, a black uh, woman. And, and it's interesting because even though it's clear that rich people and their social practice of traveling abroad and doing small meetings everywhere and then going back, etc. This was clear that they were the, 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 f the focus, the spreaders of the disease, but quickly you had like a sort of resignification and suddenly you have like governors as the governor of Sao Paulo blaming actually the victims, saying that he was worried of hip hop bells or funk uh, 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 um, parties that gather a lot of people from from uh, black communities and etc saying that they would be the the actual spreaders of the disease when, we, disease when in fact it hadn't even reached poor uh, poor neighborhoods so mm -hmm. it is interesting how there is this sort of shifts and when you we showed the 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 picture of that party it uh, it caught my attention like this, kind of like there was a cruise ship. ship. There was also a cruise ship, cruise ship. Uh, okay. and so it's sort of a reverse stigma, right? Re reverse stigmatization based on social class. <laughs> and and it's interesting because like uh, there was a, an, an interest. I was I was taking a look uh, bef a bit before the the presentation. An interesting uh, 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 Washington Post posted uh, an article, and at the end, uh, a very really very interesting and informative article. And at the end. Uh, uh, the author just says something like, okay, we, uh, the Caribbean is worried because Haiti will be the next uh, 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 source of the disease, or kind of like uh, epicenter of the disease in the Caribbean. So it's, it sounds weird a bit, and anyway. Well, so far there's no proof that that's the case, so. Well, we have a question from Tonette Carrion, and I wanted to mention, um, those of you who are who are um, listening, because we've still got a lot of presenters here, there's a you, if you check click on the Q and A function, you can submit a question, um, a typed question, since um, that's your only way of submitting a question. So I hope you will do that. Going back to Cesar, he mentioned that the great access to internet in the, in the Dominican Republic is being used in a counterproductive way. Could he elaborate on that? 
And does he believe the same issue with excessive internet access is happening in the US? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not aware of any comparisons. There may be some between uh, appropriate or inappropriate internet use in the US versus elsewhere. But I can tell you as a practicing physician and as, and as a citizen, that the amount of misinformation, the amount of fake news, and handled even by educated people, it is to the extreme, Robin. I mean, it is educated people sending this paper that was published somewhere else, this clip of someone saying so and so, and that actually becomes a tremendous distraction for practicing physicians and also a source, of, a tremendous source of misinformation. Mm -hmm. And by that, everyone is guilty. Because if your neighbor tells you something or you read something somewhere, you reproduce it. Mm -hmm. So internet in the Dominican Republic is generally not used for medical education by the government. Um, and so this was mostly a spontaneous misuse, I would say, true misuse of information. Mm -hmm. And that has settled down a bit because now there is, you know, several uh, bi-weekly and, and uh, declarations by the government, the Minister of Health, and you know, authorities in the healthcare area, presidents of scientific societies. So there's a lot more knowledge now. But the panic factor at the beginning, I think, promoted harmful information dissemination uh, by many, many people, including individuals with certain education. So. Well, have, have Dominicans um, tried the uh, Clorox treatment? or uh, chloroquine. There is even a uh, worse case now happening that brought a lot of controversies too. Um, yes, there was widespread use of hydrochloroquine, you know, empirically, I mean, meaning preventively and also for treatment. And now officially that is not what is recommended. But there is this in, in vetadine, I forgot the name, it's, a, it's an antiparasitical drug that there was some report in Australia, I believe, that in vitro worked and now there's people using it uh, because it's cheap, again, with no, absolutely no scientific base, so. Are we allowed to make not, questions? Not, di not different than what's happening in the US government right now, is it? No. <laughs> yeah. No, you can certainly, I mean, we don't have any open questions. I have some questions for you guys, but feel free to ask each other questions if you want to. No, I was willing to, to hear uh, Nancy a bit. She, she quickly uh, mentioned uh, Resolver, uh, uh, and I wanted to, to understand a bit more about this, this social practice and how kind of the pandemics is, is affecting this kind yeah, of consolidated. Sure. So it's, I mean, that's sort of a concept that has been, uh, you know, talked about a lot since the special period in the 1990s um, with the collapse of the Soviet Union and um, as a pr um, primary trading partner for the island. Um, and the... Um, the real challenges, economic challenges that people experienced um, economically and uh, yeah, just, you know, making ends meet. And so, so resolver is kind of like the idea that, you know, vamos a la batalla. It's like we're going out to the, to the street to fight, to, to get what we need. And, um, and to resolver is to, to use whatever kind of strategies that one has at their disposable, disposal to do that. Um, and, you know, to whether it's through the black market or through traveling across the city to find ingredients for um, the meal that you want to cook. Um, that's, it's just the, the sort of plethora of strategies that people use to get their, their own and their family's needs met. And so my sense is that, um, with the pandemic, what we're seeing is that people are mobilizing these networks, both through their neighborhoods, through their families, and through these online forums um, to draw on resources, not only on the island, but also off the island. And um, so the, the, the strong connections with um, Cubans in the US and living throughout the, the world is another sort of piece of this. Um, when I was there in January, for example, um, I was there when the, the um, earthquake hit uh, in eastern Cuba and there was a threat of a tsunami um, that just the information about that threat whipped through the island across WhatsApp 
channels so quickly. And I was, I was with a friend in Miramar do, visiting a church um, where she was um, sort of completing a promesa she had made on behalf of her, daughter, her granddaughter who was in Miami. And while we were at the church, she got a text from her granddaughter in Miami saying, where are you? Why aren't you home? There's a tsunami. And then calls from her daughter who was in Havana asking us to get home because of the tsunami. But then by the time we got to their house, um, the threat was alleviated and the state TV was asking, you know, the representative on the state TV was asking people to stop spreading rumors, to relax that there was no longer a tsunami, um, and to stop, you know, spreading this misinformation. Um, so, so that kind of interconnectedness is, uh, I think, being utilized in the context of the pandemic for um, for a lot of it, a lot of things. For example, people are having um, real challenges filling prescriptions and um, and getting, uh, especially for their chronic disease meds. And so, um, you, you, people are having to wait in long lines, which is not great if you have multiple chronic illnesses and you're trying to avoid exposure to um, to COVID. And so, um, so people are using these. Uh, WhatsApp to help to get neighbors to help go stand in line for them and things like that. So, um, so it's a, I think there's interesting and creative ways in which people are mobilizing all of these forums to get what they need in this in this really uh, precarious and uncertain time. Well, I, I did want to make the point, um, folks, that you can use the Q and A function to submit a question. But in the meantime, while there's no questions coming in, I want to, um, I want, I have a couple of questions. So Nancy, it strikes me, what I'm, I'm aware of how Facebook has become a really important site of kind of um, gr popular grumbling and protest um, in Cuba. And I wondered if, if Facebook was something that um, has been seeing a lot of uh, activity, you know, as, as pe if people are uh, concerned about governmental, I mean, is, there, is that become like a locus of um, social protest, um, to your knowledge? So I've been seeing a, a bit about that. Um, and um, just recently, there was an article in um, um, Periodismo de Barrio, which is a, um, a, a publication of um, journalists on the island, um, reporting on a one of their, um, or actually, I'm sorry, it was in Estornudo, El Estornudo, I believe. Um, one of their um, uh, journalists had been uh, arrested and fined 3,000 pesos for posting a, um, a meme on Instagram that uh, had the image of Fidel's tomb um, as with the juxtaposed coronavirus cell on um, on the tomb and said that the, you know, the, um, the real virus is the, was the Castro virus mm -hmm. um, and um, a few things like that. So I think that um, people are, are putting out protests. There's a lot of, um, I think that is, it seems that social media is the place where this is happening. Um, and and as, as I mentioned before, there's a, there's a strong effort on behalf of the state to, to, to sort of clamp down on that, both for the misinformation pieces that Cesar was talking about, but then also for the, for the protest um, aspect. Okay, terrific. Um, so we have a question about tourism in the Dominican Republic, and I did wanna, I'm, I'm gonna um, mention this question, but I also wanted, I, I wondered, Cesar, if the mysterious tourist deaths um, may have kind of shaped in part the government's relationship to this pandemic and its response because there, that created some shockwaves and maybe threatened a very, very important industry in the DR. But let me re read um, Janelle Marietta's question. I understand there was some violent force used to push out employees being laid off in Punta Cana in particular when the pandemic reached the Dominican Republic and tourist centers began closing. What impacts has this massive job loss had on Dominicans across the island? Do you think the level of reliance on tourism as a major industry may change in the future due to the pandemic? 
Uh, it's a complex question. Let me go back to the issue of the uh, presumed deaths that you mentioned before. That was clear by the FBI. It had to be the FBI that cleared that matter. There was an investigation requested by the Dominican government that proved that this was a series of coincidences that there was no ill intention behind that. Um, yes, there was an, initially there was such protest and and all the controversy regarding the uh, the employees. But what the uh, Tourism and Hotel Association, at least in Punta Cana, did was they um, guaranteed salaries for a number of weeks during the crisis to the employees. And that actually was reproducing many other private sectors. Um, the government imposed later on um, the minimum wage for I think was four or six weeks, but many uh, businesses in the, in, in the industry of tourism did that voluntarily. The talk is that the island is gonna open again in August. It hasn't been said officially yet, but the insinuations by the ministers and the, and the president actually during his speech is that likely by August, um, the island will open again. A lot of this will depend on the international community, right? You can have an open airport, but if people are not traveling, it doesn't lead to anything. I think ultimately the good thing is that the weather here is 24 seven year round. You know, we first get the South Americans, then we get the North Americans, then we get the Europeans, then we get the Dominicans. And so I, I think within a year, it will be back to normal business. But let me say one thing that I, I, I like you to, if you wanna comment on it or just simply mention it, which is that there is 20 times more deaths of Dominicans in New York City than there have been in the Dominican Republic. Wow. The last figure is New York City, as you know, being the center of the pandemic in the US. Latinos being Dominican surpassed African Americans as the highest ones uh, in terms of death rates. Wow. So let's not forget our patriotas there, New York. Wow. Wow, that's a really chilling statistic. Um, okay, we have a question from Mandy Nuanes. My question is for Rodrigo. Concerning the temporal and existential immobility and the intensifying of a shared sense of commonality, do you know how they have dealt with their immobility? Uh, how have they how they're dealing or how, how they historically dealt. I don't know if I got the question correct. Concerning, uh, do you know well, how they you have could answer dealt? it both ways. Both? Okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, I think there's lots of ways of dealing with it. Uh, yeah, I think expanding the, the network, uh, kind of like including more and more people. I think in a way, uh, Haiti, like, I, I mean, I've been working in Huro, Haiti, like more, right, uh, specifically. So there you can see like practices of like spending kinship in a way and including more people, right? So I would say they deal with, with, with the fear of immobility by creating kin in a way. So like exchanging more and more or expanding connections uh, in inside Haiti and outside Haiti. So I'd say that in a way, like creating more social bounds, more uh, exchange possibilities. Uh, uh, that would be one way of dealing with it. And also, uh, I would say going abroad, also like physically, right? Uh, traveling. And, and this is interesting because when we, we, we think about Haitians abroad, we tend to, to focus on the economic side, right? And when, when you talk to people that are abroad, not this, they don't necessarily conceive them there as someone that is actually only looking for, for, for money or, or jobs, right? They also value the experience, right, of, of being on the move, right, in a way. So I'd say there, there, are, there are many ways of, of dealing with, with this existential immobility that I'm trying to, to grasp here and to describe a bit. Like... Uh, uh, Offering stuff for the spirit is a way of dealing with that, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, if you want to, I don't know, to have uh, a proper burial, you have to to do your rituals, right? So you can move, so your body can actually go to Guinea, as they say, and not be stuck 
on 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 earth right on 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 your present land and that's mm. this mobilizes other narratives and 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 metaphors such as slavery as i mentioned i quickly mentioned in in when i referred to about the the colonial times mm -hmm. but also about zombification right mm. zombie is someone that didn't actually did the didn't actually move on, right? Didn't go to, to Guinea, someone that got his soul captured and his body captured and is subject to, to many types of violences, right? So how they deal with that, they, they, they try to do the rituals to, to actually have a proper death, have a proper life. So I think what this pandemic, and just to conclude what this pandemic is, is, is putting as a question, as, as, as a sort of, problem for people is how, how they're going to move on right in a way how they're going to move physically and also like the death right how when we die where do we go right if you cannot do the rituals for the people we love how we can build community right mm -hmm. in a way so i think yeah robin can i ask a question of rodriguez or of course of course you know i, I one of the things you alluded to in your talk and, and maybe i misinterpreted was this concept of lockdown um, versus isolation and if I interpret it correctly or maybe not there was an implied sort of resignation to this threat and I want to I'm wondering if, if that is the correct interpretation uh, I'm wondering you know how in the Dominican Republic it tends to be the opposite there is this sort of heroism here about things like when there's a hurricane, oh yeah, another one, so what? Nothing's gonna happen, we've seen a hundred. And people say, no, in this island, no. Rum and the sun here, nothing comes, and no one gets sick, you know what I'm saying? There's, it's, it's an interesting parallel that you don't want the sort of heroism here, you want people to take this seriously. Right. Uh, and so I'm just wondering if I interpret your point correctly about that part in Haiti, because uh, it's radically different than, than the popular vision of-, of Yeah, you know, yeah, no, it's interesting you mentioning this, I, I think, yeah, it was Robin that posted that video of that, that guy saying that uh, coronavirus, you can come, we're going to give you a brugalasso or something That's like right. that. So they're kind of like this, this performance of heroicness and, and, and also like may, hyper mayo, right? Stuff. So, uh, so the, the, the thing about the lockdown, right? The, 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 the word lock in Haitian Creole, what I was trying to argue is that so. Since I started my, my, my field work back in 2012, there was already this idea that the country was stuck, right? And you have songs like, uh, there's one song, I don't remember the author now, but he said, he sang something like, uh, Haiti is, is blocked, uh, let's uh, work together to release the country and, 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 and let it grow. And he uses the word blockist. And people were, were talking about, oh, IT is un pays blockist. So Haiti is a country that, which is the same word for, for um, traffic, right? For like uh, hard traffic. And they say, oh, I'm, I'm stuck in block use. Uh, so they were already saying that back in 2012. And then when I went back for like a, a long-term field work in 2015, 2016, uh, uh, um, no, sorry. When I went back, I did my long field work in 2015 and, and people were still talking about block use. When I went, went back there, early this year in January, I spent a month there and, and it changed. I was really reading about that. Edwige Dantica wrote uh, a piece, if I'm not mistaken, in New Yorker, uh, talking about the word lock, how people were using that in 2019, like mid 2019, when we had like a huge uh, petrol crisis, uh, when Venezuela cut off the, the, the funding of, of uh, gas, in Haiti, and then suddenly you have all these corruption scandals being brought up, people dem demonstrating against the president, and, and people couldn't move and, uh, around. They couldn't buy gas, they couldn't pay for, for a motorcycle ride, they couldn't pay for like the tap-tap ride, ride, which are those, those little trucks. And suddenly they started talking about lock, uh, pay lock, pay lock. So the country was locked. So they invented kind of like this new metaphor. And what I tried to say in the, in, in the paper was that it was already a process of, of, of lockdown in a way going on, right? People could move. There was also like this episodic violence that made people stay at home in a way. 
So, and, 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 and you know, ironically, this also helped not spreading the, the virus, right? You didn't have tourists. When I went in January this year, there was no tourists in Milo, which is like one of the most important historic towns in, 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 in Haiti, right? So I saw just like, some tourists moving around. And so ironically, it helped not spreading the virus, but at the same time, uh, uh, I think when the pandemic came, it, it only like affected more and, and gave uh, an intensified feeling of, of people, of, of immobility. So that's that. As for, as for what you mentioned, I, I, I don't see like that sort of heroic. I see more of a resignation, but I, I mean, if, I, if you wanted me to talk about resignation, I would go, it would need, I, would, I would need much more time, but so let's leave it for, for some other time. Thank you. Okay, so we have, um, we have another question from Matthew, and I just wanted to announce once again that um, we're almost out of time, but there is time for a couple more questions if anybody wants to put their question on the Q&A panel. Um, so from Matthew, are there examples you can mention of citizens doing great per personal performances of Cuban, Dominican Republic, or Haiti songs or arts online for support? Can you repeat the question? Are there examples of citizens doing, you know, per personal performances of Haitian songs or Dominican songs or Cuban songs or, or, you know, selling arts online for support? In other words, has there been an, an, an arts activism kind of response in any of these cases? Not in DDR. What is being, there's been a lot of uh, virtual concerts and sorts, you know, artists posting pieces and doing live things in Facebook and so forth. But no, there hasn't, to my knowledge, there hasn't been anything formal for fundraising purposes yet. Okay. And I would say the same, as far as my awareness um, with the Cuban performances, they, there have been live performances, but not necessarily for fundraising. Well, we have a question for Rodrigo. I may have missed this, but are the border, is the border between Haiti and the Dominican Republic closed? If so, what impact has this had on the economy of Haiti? I think Cesar can answer that. Uh, I, I don't think it's closed. It, I mean, it, Haitians are moving back to, to, to Haiti, right? So you had a sort of, I don't know if Cesar agrees, but a sort of like continuity of the politics of the policies that actually started in 2015 when they removed the, the, the citizenship of Haitians and Dominicans of Haitian descent. So you had, uh, from what I, what I read, you had like 15, uh, 150,000 Haitians that lost their citizenship like really recently uh, due to the pandemic and they're losing their jobs. So they're actually going back to, to Haiti. So the border is not closed for them to go to, to Go, go to Haiti, but I'm not sure. I mean, they can, they can always cross, right? Robin knows that more than, than anyone, right? When you, when you look at the border, you see like all these multiple actions and practices of crossing borders, right? So mm -hmm. I would say officially it might be, but practically I'll, I doubt. Yeah, the best definition of the border is, is a very porous <laughs> border, meaning you can cross if you know who you talk to, but officially it's closed now. Uh, but the, the prediction is that as soon as the construction industry goes back to normal, which is expected to be in two weeks, it's gonna, the flow is going to come back because that's the main source of employment. Yeah. Okay, I have a couple of questions and, and um, I don't see any more at the moment. We're almost out of time, but I did want to ask if anybody knew what, what Partners in Health is doing because um, and, and, you know, Partners in Health in, in, in the area of, um, in the central frontier area of Bonica is actually working, is in the Dominican Republic too. And I wondered if they, if anybody knew if, what they were up to, um, a Paul Farmer's organization. And then finally, I also wondered, because we've had a lot of entrepreneurialism in the United States. We've had a lot of charlatans selling fake PPE and masks. And I wondered, you know, um, I mean, I was thinking about this, especially in relation to Rodrigo's. Um, question about, you know, if people think this is sorcery, then um, I'm wondering if there may be some entrepreneurialism, shall we say, um, as people are, are, are wanting to combat issues of sorcery. Um, so those are my couple of questions. Well, as far as the, the um, international missions and organizations, obviously they can't come, the island is, you know, closed, 
there hasn't been any any travel. Uh, there were a few flights from China, uh, and I believe there was another one from Spain, uh, but there hasn't been any opportunity for those organizations to to help out. And, and as I said earlier, the private sector has pitched in and come forward with a lot of uh, support. Uh, as far as entrepreneurship, um, maybe this doesn't apply as such, but interestingly, I believe at least two of the private universities have come up with the 3D printing um, methodology to actually come up with clothing and masks and gloves and all those items that are badly needed. That's, there's no precedent that we know of on that because typically, well, you know, it's an engineering school, it's a computer science school to teach students and so forth, but not to produce in mass for free or subsidize masks and things like that. And that has been great. Two universities are doing it in tech uh -huh. and Ukamaima. Wow. Well, for, for um, partners in health, I, I've read some articles Paul Farmer wrote about like in, when, when the pandemic was, was reaching uh, the Caribbean, he wrote some interesting stuff on that, but he didn't mention if uh, partners in health were doing any specific job on that. I know in Milo they have the Sacre Coeur Hospital and they are kind of one of the most uh, equipped uh, uh, um, hospitals in the country actually. Uh, but this, I mean, they receive lots of money from, uh, uh, from the U.S., from missionaries and, and churches. And uh, these generated also, uh, in, in the presentation I talked more about uh, how the conspiracy theories and rumors about the disease coming from, from, from the U.S., right, or being sent by the U.S., but there's also like lots of rumors of people blaming the elites, like Haitian elites and, and politicians of using this, this pandemic to actually make profit, right? A sort of like mm. state, state against nation redux in a way. Um, as, as for the entrepreneurial uh, act, uh, practices <laughs> and actions, that, that's interesting because I mean, when you go to markets in, in popular markets in Haiti, uh, and, and you see like people selling medicines and all this like uh, ointments and stuff like that. So I haven't specific information about that uh, for COVID, uh, but, um, but I've, heard, I've heard like I've been, I, 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 people keep sending me, like my friends keep sending me like all these recipes of like, oh, drink water a lot, uh, uh, mm -hmm. ginger tea. So they're not harmful, right, in a way. And, and there's always like some, some doctor um, that is graduated from I don't know where, but so specifically, I wouldn't have much. I have just a scene that I would like to 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 describe here, which was when I was crossing the border early January uh, uh, in Dahab between between Monamante and Dahabon. So I was going back to Brazil, and usually I go I go from Santo Domingo, and I cross I was crossing the border. The pandemic was was not in the Caribbean yet, or at least was not like as as powerful as it is right now, but people were already talking about it, right? And I was there in the in the Duane, in the Aduana, du in the Aduana, in in the Habon, and then I see like people were already wearing masks, right? The the, the officers and, and 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 people from the Duane, and and I saw like in the booth like small pieces of garlic and lime and slices of lime, and then I'm like. <laughs> I already knew they were kind of like protecting themselves from COVID, but I asked them, they're like, yeah, no, they say it's good. It doesn't harm you, so we do it anyway. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think we have one more question from Ryan Asaf, and then, and then we're gonna have to close up. For all panelists, a lot of work in the United States has been shifted to online, work from home. Is there an infrastructure to support this in these three countries? Who would benefit, who would this benefit? And for those you know, who did not benefit, what impact does this have economically and from a health perspective? Well, um, in the DR, uh, where internet connection is so av widely available, uh, schools, private schools have done a tremendous job in continuing education through virtual uh, access. Uh, as far as business are concerned, banking has been the most benefit of all. Uh, followed by the uh, media industry. Um, as far as telehealth, telemedicine, um, mm -hmm. 
there has not been a previous uh, experience on that, and we did start that in our institution um, it, with the approval of the private insurance companies. Um, the restaurant industry that has been closed for the last three months, they were given permission to deliver and for take home, and they are using internet, and so are the grocery stores. Um, so I, I think that has been very positive because it's a sort of a, you know, underlining economy that is moving uh, and not everyone is losing, so. Okay, well, there's a little bit of a follow-up, but we're kind of out of time. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll mention it, maybe we can briefly, then we'll briefly close. Also, I wanted to mention that Nadej mentioned that there's an interview with Paul Farmer on COVID-19 in Haiti, and she's posted the um, goats and soda. She's posted this um, on the Q&A if, if you want to have a sense of that citation. Um, how do the differences in those who could sustain themselves without working in person compare to those who have to work in person impact health disparities in these countries? If you can answer briefly. In the uh, I mean, I would say in, in Cuba, because they've kept the rates down so low, um, there's not, uh, I, I don't think I, we can say that there's a big disparity. Um, but there are people who, you know, are still out selling ice cream in the street, still out selling peanuts. Um, and so they're coming in contact in ways that are not um, ideal. Um, there, you know, people were recommended in, in um, March to work from home when possible. Um, but you have to remember that one of the largest industries on the island and one of the biggest sites for, especially for women's entrepreneurship, mm. is the tourism industry. Mm. And so the fact, the complete, you know, cessation of tourism has been um, dramatic uh, on, on so many levels. Um, and from the informal to the formal. And so, uh, so I think we're just, you know, I don't think we can tell the impact of that yet. I mean, the first cases were, you know, March 11th and they were brought in by Italian tourist. Um, but, um, but yeah, so, so I think that there has been a minimal amount of telecommuting for people, but people, not the majority of people don't have like computers in their house that are gonna support this kind of work. Um, so, um, so I think it's a, it's a real challenge. And it, in terms of instruction, um, educational instruction, it's happening on the television for like all levels mm -hmm. um, in order to kind of uh, equalize access. Um, mm -hmm. But that, of course, as in many parts of the United States, puts a lot of burden on parents to make sure that they're overseeing it. Well, Robin, I, I think in VR, I'm, I'm sorry, Rodrigo, go ahead. No, I think I would say just it's, it's more or less the same in Haiti, uh, except the part of the television that Nancy mentioned. I think people depend on like, being on the street, right, on, on buying and selling. So, uh, yeah, uh, we still have to see, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I would say the same. Uh, the video clip that I showed of the metro full of people, those folks were not going to exercise at the park. They were going to work. 40 something percent of Dominicans make a living working outside home in the streets or informal businesses. So people have to go out to work. And when the social support of the government runs out, people starve. So the beginning of the opening, of the reopening this week, is a risky endeavor, if you will, because we don't know what will happen in the next two weeks. But on the other hand, the pressure on the government was so big by the public and not only the private sector, that they have to be in let go. So let's keep our fingers crossed. All right, well, um, I think we're at the end, we're out of time here, but I just wanted to thank our panelists because this has been an incredibly wonderful, rich set of presentations. And, you know, I just feel we're so lucky to ha have brought you guys together. And um, if anybody wants to see that this, um, or, you know, wants other friends of yours to see it, it's gonna be available on the Latin American Institute uh, Facebook page. Is that correct, Brian? Yes, it is, and also on our YouTube channel. Um, they're okay. both CLA, LAI. Perfect, perfect. So I right, believe well, that that concludes us for today, or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But thank you so much, panelists. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you, Brian. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. It was amazing. Thank nice you, to Brian. meet you, Nancy Cesar. And yeah. I did just want to let our attendees know we have a couple of other events on COVID-19 coming up in the next couple of weeks in the Latin American Institute. Um, on June 4th, we're going to have part two of a two-part series. It may be more parts than that. Who knows? On um, 
on the impact of COVID-19 on Mexican agricultural workers in the United States and particularly in California. And it's, it's not finalized yet, but the week after that, before the quarter ends, we're also looking at an additional event um, comparing the way that state level politics have um, impacted the response to the virus in the US, Canada, and Mexico. Um, so please follow us on please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, and you can keep up to date about those events as they're finalized. Thanks a lot.